All right, everyone, welcome back to Simply Bitcoin. We break down the news from Twitter, the daily fail, meme review, software releases, hardware releases, and the websites by plebs. Joining us today, fellow Bitcoiner, student of history, sound money advocate, freedom maximalist, a financial sovereignty, nationally he's uh he's actually the host of the first nationally syndicated bitcoin radio show i'm talking about yeah. mark moss yeah <laughs> Thanks so much. All right? oh you did awesome good job on the first take <laughs> 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 all right here we go let's dive into the numbers let's do it number time Number Time is brought to you by Bitcoin 2022. It's going to be the largest Bitcoin conference ever hosted in sunny, sunny Miami Beach. Get your tickets now before the price goes up. You can take advantage of the link down below for 10% off your ticket to Bitcoin 2022. At the time of this recording, the block height is 715,307. The Bitcoin price, 49,015. Chain rewrite day, 765. Total public lightning capacity, 3,310.54. Moscow time 2040, blocks to the halving 124,693. Nico, the numbers. The numbers. <laughs> All right, uh, the I'm gonna make the same joke I keep making. The thing that matters is the all-time high in the block height, right? The Kaka Fiat price is noise, but it, this is awesome. We had a very unique situation because we've had awesome guests the last couple weeks, right? And the price has been frozen in time, so we've gotten to ask the guests, how do you feel about the price being uh, frozen in time? So I'm going to pass it on to Mark. Mark, what the F is going on? Are you as bored as we are? Well, the first thing I would say is that I agree with you that the price is a distraction, but I would disagree with you about what the most important metrics are. So um, what I like to say on a regular basis is that the, sh the price is a distraction. The short-term price is a distraction. What we should be looking at, when you're looking at a new technology, you should be looking at two things. One is the growth of the network. Um, which I guess is the block size, like how long is the network growing? But really I look about, about the amount of users. So the growth of the network, like Metcalf's law, and second, the development that's happening on the network. Um, and so as long as those two things is growing, the development's happening, then we know the price will take care of itself. Um, so anyway, uh, as far as uh, am, I, am I bored with the price? The answer is actually no. Um, I'm actually not that bored with the price because what I'm really looking at is, you know, we a year ago was about, 20,000 year before that was about 7,000. So year over year, we've done really well. Uh, we did, we ran up to 65,000 pullback and then consolidated in the $30,000 range. And then we ran up to almost 70,000 and now we're pulled back and we're consolidating at the 50,000 range. So what I'm looking at is we consolidated at 30. Now we're consolidating at 50. That's pretty dang good in my opinion. So I feel pretty good about this, uh, you know, sitting right here in this $50,000 range right now. I feel that it's gaining some momentum, gaining some um, some steam like a coil and is gonna, you know, probably blast off hopefully soon. So not super bored. I'm actually uh, feeling pretty good about where it's sitting. I love that freaking answer, bro. That was yeah, amazing. Man. I love that. I love that. We have all the Bitcoiners just like, yeah, I don't care. But Mark, Mark knows. So Mark, let me ask you something. You, you said something specific about the growth of the network, and I completely yeah. agree with you. And I think we, I've been blind to it because I'm looking at it from the perspective of a Bitcoin miner, right? So I'm like, yeah, you know, TikTok next block, right? Yeah. But what metric would you look at for something, the growth of the network? Or are you seeing that and you're making assumptions based on what happened in El Salvador, based on the Lightning Network growth? Or what metric are you looking at? Or is it just a combination of things? Uh, so there's obviously, you know, the on-chain data that we can see, like the growth of smaller wallets, you know, less than 10 Bitcoin or less than five Bitcoin, however you want to denominate that. I'd say probably what I pre predominantly am looking at is more news, news that's breaking that would push more users into the ecosystem. So for example, earlier in this year, NIDIG came out and said they were going to bring back office bank services to 330 million checking accounts where they could buy, sell and store Bitcoin from their checking account. Uh, many people said that wouldn't happen before the end of the year, but it is. U.S. Bank announced they're the very first one that brings more users that's the growth of the network right this brings more people in um so probably more fundamental news things that uh, you know paypal venmo uh, allowing people to buy bitcoin um not that it's the best way we don't recommend that obviously but it brings more people into the ecosystem and so um i would look at the fundamental news and so those are more like leading indi indicators right so like on-chain data is more like a lagging indicator that tells us what already happened i'm looking at like what's going to happen in the future and i so i think the news is the place to do that things that will make it easy to bring new users in Absolutely. And one last thing, Mark. So 
a lot of people, a lot of Bitcoiners got this year wrong, right? It, it, and specifically the TA guys, uh, you know, you had Pomp, you had Max Kaiser, and, you know, I'm friends with all of them. They're good dudes. Yeah. But in the sense that I think that a lot, including myself, by the way, this is the reason that we don't talk about, we don't make price predictions on the show, but yeah. I was, I fit on that boat, right? You know, we were all expecting 100K Bitcoin by December. I know, Phil, you yeah. were on that boat as well. What yep, happened? I was I was on the boat as well. What happened? <laughs> what what went wrong? What what did we what what did we miss? Right? What what did we not anticipate? Yeah. So I try to stay away from predictions as well. I, I feel much more confident in longer term predictions than I do in shorter term predictions, um, because of that news. You know, that fundamental news, and, and it's kind of a leading indicator. Um, I try as much as I try to stay away, and I try to stay conservative. I thought uh, I think a hundred k by the end of the year was like pretty conservative number, even though I was hoping for a lot more. And so anyway, I was wrong there. What went wrong? Um, Again, I, I try not to get too caught up into that into that data of what what went wrong, what every price move. I would say a couple of things. I think um, one, we've seen uh, a lot of financialization happen inside the Bitcoin market, and so that's a little bit troubling. Uh, when, actually, when I started my YouTube channel several years ago, I started with a four part video series talking about this exact topic. So the first four videos on my channel three years ago to cover this and basically it was wall street coming in to financialize um, Bitcoin and creating more Bitcoin. So we talk about Bitcoin as a fact fixed cap of 21 million. And I said, one thing that's going to be at risk is they're going to come in and try to create more Bitcoin. They'll do that through the paper market. And so that was like three years ago, if you go watch those old videos and that's exactly what we're seeing today. And so what happens is supply and demand, right? We can sit here and have this academic argument of inflation and what drives prices and push demand and whatever. At the end of the day, it's, it's supply and demand, right? So if uh, if I wanted to get access to Bitcoin um, and I was a fund or an institution or a billionaire, I would have to go buy Bitcoin. But today, if I want to put, you know, a million dollars in or a hundred million, I'd have to go buy a hundred million of Bitcoin, pull that off the market. Today, I can do a a cash settled futures of that same allotment, which has no effect on the, um, you know, supply demand of that Bitcoin itself. So I think that's one of the big problems. We're seeing this paper demand, it's, it's artificially taking away the demand for Bitcoin. Um, that, and I, anyway, so that, that's probably my number one uh, catalyst for that, I guess. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's it's awesome that you mentioned that because uh, it, Catlin Long had an amazing thread describing that exact yeah. thing, right? That that the price should be, it's it, it, it's been artificially suppressed by this paper Bitcoin, it should be a lot higher but and and one of the warnings that she's been touting out a while, if you've been following her account, is this this uh, this word that she uses rehypothecation, right? So yep. is is that what you're talking about, Mark? Well, the rehypothecation is different, right? So rehypothecation is basically I'm loaning it out over and over and over. So for example, um, an easy analogy would be if I had a candy bar and I loaned it to you, Nico, you would owe me a candy bar. So on my books, I would have an IOU that you you owe me a candy bar. You would you would have the candy bar, but then you could loan it to Phil. So now you would have an IOU from Phil, but you would also owe me, right? Now, so now there's three candy bars, even though there's really only one physical candy bar. Now, what happens if Phil gets hungry and eats that candy bar? Now, three candy bars disappear out of the system, even though there was only one. So that's kind of that rehypothecation example. Um, and that's being done. So that also creates artificial demand. So first you have the cash future. So that's artificial demand right off the bat. Um, but then those cash futures can then be rolled, rehypothecated over and over, which then just increases it even more. And in the gold industry, we see there's about 500 paper ounces of gold for every one physical ounce of paper gold. Holy crap. Wow. Oh my gosh. And that's essentially, that's how they, they, you know, they, they suppress the price of gold, right? That's what I hear all the time. Well, gold, I mean, that's one of the ways gold's, gold's different. Gold doesn't have a free market. So the price of gold is set every morning by some guys over in London, that's the London Bullion Market Exchange. Some guys get on the phone in the morning. What should we have the price of gold be today? And that's how it's settled. So it's kind of stupid. Um, it's more complex than that, but that's, that's the basics of it. A lot of people say that Bitcoin has this natural defense because we can own our own keys, right? So we could just pull that money off the exchange. Um, and, and that's true. We can do that. Um, and I think that's kind of this natural defense mechanism. But these futures are specifically set up for cash. They're not, they're not physically settled. Every physically settled ETF that's been proposed, the SEC shot it down. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, uh, do you anyway. See, do you see some maliciousness in that or is it just a coincidence? 
speculation. We're speculating. You know, well, you know, yeah. uh, if you if you watch any of my content, um, I, I definitely dabble on that side of the aisle. Um, I tend to think, though, uh, unfortunately, it's just a bias of mine. I tend to think people are good. I think it's probably more, not probably so malicious in a sense where the SEC is not approving them because they really want to control the price of Bitcoin. Um, I would say probably not malicious. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, let's see. Let's see how things play out. We'll we'll stay on top of it. But anyways, Phil, it's time for the daily fail. The daily fail is brought to you by Amber App. Check them out. Amber dot app. It's the easiest way to buy Bitcoin. Stack Bitcoin with an app that's made by actual Bitcoiners. The link is down below. Gonna be off for a couple of days. Not gonna see you soon. I'm gonna miss you. So I'm just gonna tell you now. Merry Christmas, my friend. Umber, the smart way to stack sets. Got some some lights. Light fails today, but fails nonetheless. Very interesting stuff, though. We're going to start off with a thread from at nodding off. In ETH, the 100 biggest holders have 40% of the total supply. In BTC, the top 100 holders have plus or minus 15% of the total supply. Mm. Uh, so centralization on amazon web services and centralization in terms of holders and this is going to proof of stake which increases the power of these holders no way okay let's take a look at let's take a look at some of these charts right i think i think one thing real quick though that yeah. that kind of proves so like first of all i think when people say even with bitcoin it's too decent it's too centralized at the top right i think a lot of that is uh is you know misunderstanding the data so like you know if i Coinbase or whatever is going to show up as some of those largest wallets, but that's going to represent, you know, millions of customers, right? But mm -hmm. the difference is here, the reason why that number is so different. So first of all, when someone points to Bitcoin, that's why that's false, because it's, it's really decentralized by the owners that have it in Coinbase. But I think what it really shows is that coin or with Bitcoin, we pound the table on not your keys, not your coin. And so the majority of Bitcoiners know to get their Bitcoin off the exchanges, whereas Ethereum holders obviously don't. So even though they could claim that to be true, where, hey, it's at Coinbase and you know it's really decentralized ownership, well, don't they know that they're supposed to get it off the exchange? Uh, so it kind of just shows the makeup of the holder of Ethereum. Yeah, I like these takes, man. This I is know. totally different than yeah. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't think of this. That's great. Okay, well, look, take take a look, right? Like, I mean, going to your, you know, to your point. Let's take a look at like the uh, here's here's the Binance distribution. Okay, here's the BNB distribution. Look, the top 100 holders like over 92 and a half percent. Wow. I mean, this is it's like you said, right? Look, Doge, not really surprised here. Getting close to 80 percent. So. Yeah. So look, I think this goes back to your point, right? We do pound the table for not your keys, not your coin. We also talk about, you know, having a hardware wallet or, of course, running Bitcoin Core. You know, that's, you know, th these are the correct ways to do it and, you know, to continue to learn. And look, I, I think it shows the results, right? I think the other thing, though, the Bitcoin. <laughs> the, the other thing that you said that we just didn't really dig in on for people that are listening, though, I think is the other thing is that even when people point to Bitcoin and say, ah, oh, look at the top 100, it's too, too concentrated at the top. Owning a lot of Bitcoin doesn't give you any control over the network, mm -hmm. right? Bingo. But two, you mentioned with POS. So when you look at these POS coins, um, one, the makeup of those people probably holding them on exchange and not, not holding them on their own. They should. But two, having more coins does give you control over the network on a POS because you get additional votes. And so um, it's kind of like um, Lynn Alden used this example it almost be like the amount of money you have equals the amount of votes that you get, right? So if I had, if I was a school teacher making 30 grand a year and I had $300 to vote, I'd, I'd get 300 votes and then I get paid a dollar back for every vote that I make. So I pay 300 bucks, get 300 votes, I get 300 back. But if I'm Jeff Bezos with 30 billion, I can buy 300 million votes and then I get 300 million back. So whose stack is going to grow faster? Obviously, getting 300 million back versus 300 is way faster. And so that's kind of how the POS system works. And so when you look at when you try to compare those two metrics, it's not apples to oranges. Having more Bitcoin gives you no control. Having more POS coins gives you massive control. Absolutely. And this is what they don't get. And so, Mark, we, we've always said this on the show, essentially, the fact that um, we, we always said this on the show that proof of stake coins are are essentially impossible and not only because essentially it's like a it's a perpetual energy machine but not only that we've also said that um 
that the current fiat system is a proof of stake system already, yeah. right? So is, yeah. would, would it be too, and the reason for that is exactly what you just explained, right? The more fiat you have, the more you could manipulate, so to speak, right? The network to your advantage, whereas in Bitcoin, it's exactly what you said. Even if you have a million Bitcoin and the person that has one Bitcoin, they don't have more influence over the network. They can't tweak the network to their advantage. That's exactly right. And then there's a number of things that we can dig into. But one of those is the, you know, the Cantillon effect, which whoever's closest to the money supply has the advantage there. And so if I have a big chunk of POS tokens and I stake those in the example I just gave, I get 330 million back. With Bitcoin, doesn't, if, I ha if I have all those tokens, I don't get any back. I have, if I'm Michael Saylor, I have the exact same opportunity to get Bitcoin as Michael Saylor does, right? I'm still going to have to go buy them. I'm still going to have to go earn them. I'm still going to have to plug a miner in, whatever. We're on an even playing field. Yes, he has more money. He can go buy more than me, but that's a whole different story. In the Bitcoin network, we are equal. In a POS network, we are not equal. Absolutely. And, and, and yep. I think that people miss that. And, you know, unfortunately, they don't understand that proof of work is the innovation because they're getting caught up on the energy they're getting cut up on the environment you know on that narrative which is oh this is bad for the environment this is bad for whatever proof of stake must be better because it's more efficient right you know that whole narrative which is which is garbage it's so lazy such a lazy way of thinking right it's yeah. like on, on, on two levels one they haven't done any time to like figure out really the difference of pow versus pos which by the way shout out to lynn alden she put out a monster paper a couple of weeks ago on comparing pos to pow it's like a 45 minute academic read so good luck with it but if you if you want to know read that paper um the other thing i would say is that back to the energy debate if you know anything again if you spend even a little bit of time just thinking about this um where I'm in Puerto Rico, but where I'm from in Southern California, in the summertime, the top um, tier of power is 40 cents per kilowatt hour. 40 cents a kilowatt That's hour. Absurd. You can't mine Bitcoin there. It's too expensive. You need to be under 5 cents a watt and really to be super competitive, probably under 3 cents a watt. Well, if it's 40 in California, why the heck, like, where could you get it for three? Well, only places that have too much energy and there's not enough people buying it. So Bitcoin only goes to places that have wasted energy that they're just going to use, that it's going to go to waste anyway. And so if you just spend half a second to even think this through, you'd realize that energy argument is completely bogus. But, Absolutely. But, but, you know, it has to do with, you know, the tech and, and we just don't get it. We're closed minded. <laughs> We're closed minded. Okay. We just don't understand the innovation. The, it's the community. It's, it's the tech narrative. <laughs> like you see what? Like, yeah. Uh, was that was that the only fail? <laughs> no, no, not at all. all right, well, let's, let's keep go going. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. That, that was just like the. It was a know, warm up. It was a warm yeah, up. All it was right, the warm up I, fail. It was a great this warm up. Is, here's here's the uh, here's the real one. All right, so we got tagged by Neurosploits. All right, what a bunch of apes. <laughs> Here we go. Those four simple words have been whispered since the times of the Romans. Rubes gonna rube. What are they talking about? Looks like the monkey kingdom has been hacked. Mm. Anyways, over 7,000 SOL. You know, I mean, people know that SOL stands for shit out of luck, right? So it's really <laughs> yeah. ironic that that is the name of the token and not one person has sat there and been like, you realize that they're trolling you, right? Like all this big money. Anyways, that's just my, my personal opinion. Anyways, over 7,000 uh, 7, soul or uh, $1.2 million US got lost on Solana NFT mint due to a hack that happened on the Discord channel. This is, this is brilliant. It's the future mm. of finance. It, it's totally the future. Hold on, I gotta zoom in. Just before the real mint, a big hack happened over the Monkey Kingdom Solana NFT project. Over 1.2 million is hacked from thousands of people who tried to mint, and some individuals are reporting that they lost 650 soul, or about 100k. Mm. Yeah, so here we go. Here's one guy, you know, you can see the tweet. Guys, I got drained, 650 soul. Uh, it's my biggest mistake. I'm always recommending people using a burner, but I was nervous and FOMO'd the Monkey Kingdom Mint. Never <laughs> thought it was not legit. And look at this. It's important money to my family, my wife, and my oh, son. That's, sad, that's ex dude. Th th this is the, and this is why, like, we're not, we're not, you know, like, I know that people see us, you know, talking aggressively and making fun of stuff, but at the end of the day, 
that's the point. This is exactly the point. It's important to these people. Why are yeah. you know? It's like why are you getting tricked into this garbage? This yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. Just just go to Bitcoin. You don't Get need this crap. Bitcoin. Anyways, let's keep going here. Just wait till we go take a look at their site. Um, it's not sure how the hack actually happened, but seems that the malicious bot sent an official announcement with a malicious link, which looked exactly like the original oh, okay. website. Here's the domain name. Don't and click on it. Don't no, click no, no, on it. Of course not. <laughs> but we're just, you know, it's just a screenshot. And here we go. Okay. So all of a sudden, of course, on the Medium article, it stopped letting me highlight. So we've had to change the highlighting. But anyways, since minting such a big project is a race of fast fingers, a lot of people didn't pay attention to what was going on. The website asked for permission from a phantom wallet, and it actually drained all the SOL from their wallet. Dude. This is Monkey Kingdom is one of the known blue chip projects in Solana NFT space, currently sitting at 45 SOL FP. I don't even know what that means, but reaching the floor price of up to 100 SOL. I guess they're talking about each NFT going for 45 minimum price up to 100 soul. Yeah. So anyways. All right. This seems like a well-planned attack. They reported earlier that malicious links were spreading via DM, so they announced to not click anything except the official announcement channel, and that is what happened. The malicious bot sent the announcement from the official channel, and people were rushing like crazy to be the first one to mint. They also reported a DDoS attack on their website, which made it unavailable just before the mint. And you can see here is a little announcement. You're sincerely sorry, but you lost your money anyways. Yeah, yeah exactly, right? So sincerely apologize. All right, to prevent... Th this is good. To prevent such things in the future, be sure to have a burner wallet. Or, or just don't partake in this crap. You could just <laughs> do that and not have to deal with a burner wallet. Yeah. The burner wallet is just another account, which is there to hold your temporary funds allocated for minting. For a better explanation, check this video below. So, so essentially, they're telling you, like, listen, you're going to get rug pulled again, but you could get rug pulled for less if you just use a different, you know, a different wallet with less funds in it. It's very... Well, hey, you know, if you keep getting rug pulled over and over, eventually it will work one time, right? Right? Exactly. <laughs> eventually, it's, it's going to go. Okay, so look, we, we had to go take a look at their website, okay, because I had no choice, right? <laughs> there, there was no choice on this. So here we go. This is the, uh, this is the monkey kingdom. Okay, you can see here it's very nice, right? We got these these unique drawings. So so check this out. Unique drawings, them. very unique. <laughs> Never seen this. Welcome to the Monkey Kingdom. Two thousand two hundred and twenty-two algorithmically generated Wukong inspired apes. This is good. Imprisoned in the Solana blockchain. I want you to keep in mind they're they're imprisoned on the Solana blockchain. Who is Sun Wukong? Sun Wukong, also known as the Monkey King, is a legendary mythical creature capable of extreme mass destruction. Wukong has been magically imprisoned by the Buddha under a mountain for over 500 years and has now escaped. Man. But just before he was, it was imprisoned on the Solana blockchain. This is hurting my ears, Phil. I know, I know. I'm just <laughs> like, this is, dude, imagine, imagine that you spend, imagine the money that you, you put and the time that you put in, into, into growing your family's wealth. And this is the story that got you to dive into this crap. Okay. And just, just wait. Okay. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> yeah, imagine it does get worse. The Monkey Kingdom is a collection, right? As we said before, 2,222 randomly generated 32 by 32 pixel NFTs on the Solana blockchain. Each Wukong is unique and comes with different traits and attributes varying in rarity. So... I feel like I'm losing brain cells. Listen, yeah, dude, I'm, 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 I'm like, ah, this hurts. And, 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 and I'm, and I'm glad that you guys are younger than me because otherwise I'd feel like a full boomer here. I don't know. <laughs> just, but, but this is the thing, right? Like, I'm, it's so brutal. Just wait. It, it keeps going. Okay, here we go. This, this is where they give you, this is where they give you the value proposition. Okay, check this out. What will permanently drive up a collection's value? We believe there are three types of NFT buyers. I believe there's only one. But apparently there's three. Um, the collectors, the investors, and the flippers, right? The collectors buy it because they like art. They're never selling. The investors <laughs> buy with the intent to eventually sell for a profit. And the flippers buy with the intent to flip, to pay the next month's rent. They've got this all figured out. What attracts buyers to a particular collection? Marketing will attract collectors. Check this out. Celebrity endorsement, mainstream media pickup, building an exclusive brand. I mean, did these people just kind of put their company notes on their webpage and just explain how they were going to shill this crap to you? 
Uh, it's, it's brutal. The next, the next thing that attracts buyers is utilities will attract investors. Okay. I love their definition of what utilities are, by the way. You like that? <laughs> Creating utilities that would generate returns, coins, floor sweeps. So, so check this out. Buying the NFT isn't enough. There's going to be another shit coin. There's going to be a derivative shit coin from this shit coin JPEG thing. And then the last piece of it is hype will attract the flippers. New royalty announcements and PR stunts. I, and I think back to the guy who dropped 100K into this. Or, or the, the person, sorry, that dropped 100K into this. That was important to his family. Very important to his family. And then, okay, so here we go. This is where we're, this is where we're going to end off, where it just gets really strange. Okay. The Asian markets wants to own NFTs. I didn't realize that they couldn't buy these shit coins right now. Uh, anyways, they just don't know how. Monkey Kingdom gives Asian investors their first chance to purchase NFTs. One of the core aims of our project is to give the Asian communities around the world a voice in a growing new space that gives them the important representation they deserve. What? Uh, that sounds racist. <laughs> it's just, yeah, like, doesn't it? Like, it, it's just really strange. And it's funny that you mentioned that, Nico, because to be perfectly honest, this was the next line. Why mint if I am not based in Asia? This is a great way to diversify your NFT portfolio while at the same time join a culturally diverse community. I don't think they know what diverse means. I know they wrote the word. We hope that you can join our exclusive yacht parties club events in Asia. So there you go, guys. That's the that's the what that's was. what they call that's what they call utility. Um, if you buy that token, then maybe you'll get to come to our yacht party. And uh, was it? Oh, was it? Oh, Gary V, he sold his NFT thing and um, it has utility. Don't worry. The NFT has utility. If you buy Gary V's NFT, then you get to come to his event. Mm. I was like, so that's like pre-selling a ticket? <laughs> like, <laughs> is, that, is that what that is? That's the utility? So, my, so my, my, my ticket I bought has utility. I get into a concert. <laughs> Exactly. Phil. But I wanted to ask you, okay, because you from the historic sorry, Nico, before we get into before we go over to you, I just want to ask you, Mark, because I, I like, you know, looking over your Twitter, like I could see you're like a student of history, yeah. you know, the, the history of money. So I, I just need to ask you and and please, if if we're wrong, because I've been making, you know, we've been making fun of these things for <laughs> since they came out. If we're wrong, you tell us like what we're missing. Like, are, are NFTs in any way, shape, or form a, a store of value, or is this just like the like a uh, you know like the baseball card craze, like the Beanie Babies, like all of these you know collectible crazes? Well, and I will was, say, when we were just bagging on Peter Schiff, we were saying there is no such thing as intrinsic value; all value is subjective. So, if people want to assign value to them, then there's value to them. Now, growing up as a kid, I knew lots of people who collected baseball cards and collected stamps and collected coins, and I just wasn't into that. But that doesn't mean that those those baseball cards don't have a lot of value to them, right? And doesn't mean that those, like, I have a younger brother and he sells Pokemon cards and he makes a lot of money buying and selling Pokemon cards. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not into it. I never played Pokemon. I don't understand the intricacies. So, um, you know, there is something to be said. I mean, money does um, go into, into collectibles. And actually, if you look at the history of money, money is like an evolution. So if you look at Bitcoin, for example, or look at the way money comes into existence. So money has been seashells and feathers and rocks and all these things. And so typically what happens is something is sort of scarce and you start, it becomes a collectible. And once enough people um, use it as a collectible, it can become a store of value. So for example, the really rich people store their value in collectible cars, fine art, right? That's, there's a big market for that. Um, eventually, if that store of value, be, the collectible evolves to a store of value, the store of value could evolve into a medium of exchange if it has the right um, attributes, and then maybe eventually to a medium of exchange. So Bitcoin has definitely started as a collectible, has proven the store of value. It's on its way to the medium exchange in like El Salvador and places. And eventually I do believe it'll get to the unit of account. Um, these types of things, I mean, Pokemon cards and baseball cards are stores of value. I suppose people are storing value in them. Um, I don't get it. I think these, at, and at the same, at, at, at the all economics is driven by scarcity. Mm -hmm. And so if I have a Mickey Mantle baseball card, again, I don't know anything about baseball cards, but if I had a Mickey Mantle baseball card from whatever, 1955, you're not going to get any more of those. But when I can just mint whatever they just said, right? It's a 2000 crypto or 
algorithmically produced things or whatever, right? And I think about, uh, I've been a real estate investor. I started my career 18 years old, buying and selling um, properties, fixing up and selling them. I'm, I still invest in real estate. The t- number three thing, the top three things that you look at in real estate are, do you guys know? Location, location, location. location. So- <laughs> So, 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 so beachfront property, property on a lake is going to appreciate way more than properties that aren't, right? Because they're scarce. There's no more beachfront property, for example. But then you have this like decentral land, virtual property. I'm pretty sure there's an unlimited amount of that, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Like I'm pretty sure there's an unlimited amount of that land. So like what drives that scarcity principle? So anyway, uh, you know, some people are going to want to put their money into baseball cards. I don't get it. They will do it. And I guess they'll want to put it into Pokemon cards or NFTs, um, Good luck. Don't don't put your don't put your kids' money in there. Exactly. And I think you I think you really hit the nail on the head, right? Which is, and we were actually talking about this earlier on the week. Which is, okay, um, if you try copying a, a, a painting, right? Try copying that exact painting with the yeah. exact brushes, with the exact wood, exactly. And then with these NFTs, you could literally make an exact copy because yeah. it's, it's, it's digital. It's all ones and zeros, right? So yeah, I agree. I think that in in the physical world, right. It's very hard to make a copy of something, but in the digital and, world. And that's the key point. I think that's the key point, Nico, right? So if I have a Mona Lisa painting and I, I have this painting on my wall right here, I have this Mona Lisa painting. There's only one Mona Lisa painting. Now you can go and take a picture of it. Sure. You can go take a picture of it and you can print it out and you can buy a fake copy. You can print, buy a print to put on your wall, but there's only one original, just like that old Mickey Mantle card or whatever it may be. Um, I think the problem, in my opinion, with this NFT thing is they're trying to take like a physical item and then re- put it into a virtual world, right? Bitcoin is natively digital, right? We've taken electricity and created a digital asset. Um, I think in the future, I mean, we've probably all seen the movie Ready Player One. Uh, I think in the future, there is this virtual reality world and I'm probably going to want a car or some shoes that are going to be an NFT, I suppose. But um, and and there might be something there in the future. Um, I was around investing in the early days in the late 90s of the internet. So I've seen these things progress. And so I think there, that will get there at some point. But <laughs> Trying to create a JPEG that I can create a copy of a JPEG of a JPEG. I'm like that. This this just makes no sense to me. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's, <laughs> it's literally it's the copy of a JPEG. That's what. You, you- I was gonna say he said it so much more elegantly than both of us, right? Like, cause, cause we sit there and we we sound like these these apes, right? We're like sitting there, and we're like, "This is stupid." Watch Nico's gonna print it. Look, he printed it. And we're like, "We're gonna share it." And like Mark comes in and just explains it elegantly. Yeah. One of the best memes I saw was uh, like uh, I don't know what they're called, but like the little meme where it's like the little squiggly drawings of people, and they're like at the party, and there's like people dancing on the dance floor, and there's a guy standing. There's a guy standing in the corner over there, and he go he goes. I bet they don't know that I own this song. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know what? We have to find that one. I know that I have a variation of that one. It's amazing. Uh, but it's like man. what? But but it's like that's kind of like how stupid it is, right? So he owns the the NFT of that song, but who cares? Everybody listens to the song. I have the song yes. too. I have it. I have it on my streaming thing. You own it. Big deal, right? Um, that's kind of the absurdity of it. Yeah, and if you and let, let's compare the two, right? Try making a copy of a Bitcoin. Try it, right? Yeah. Try it, yeah. right? Try making a copy of an NFT, right? Yeah. Again, or so a 1950 like, Mickey Mantle card. Like yeah. you can't do that either. You can't this do that exactly either. Exactly right. If you mm-hmm. reprint it, how much of that value is lost? I have, man. I had tons of Mickey Mantle reprints when I was a kid. Yeah, I love those things. You know, I was like, oh, it's gonna be worth tons. It's a Mickey Mantle. Mm-hmm. You know how many? Yeah, you know, it's like they're still yeah. worth two cents. And, and yeah. it, 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 honestly, the giveaway though, Phil, was on the website because on the website it says, it, "Patient investors, you're gonna have to, you're gonna sell this to somebody else." So it's like. I know, like, it, Who's people, gonna buy it? people buy art because they want to, you know, of course, it stores value. There's tax reasons as well, right? But, you know, you actually, you get to store it, right? You know, some people show it off. Some people just store it, right? But anyways, really, really good fail, Phil. It made me want to pull out my hair multiple times, but <laughs> it was a good fail. It was a it good was cringe, fail. man. It I was the one, the, the one thing that it makes me think about, too, and I did a video on this recently. I called it Generation Gamble. And we're in this problem, and it's a, it's a fiat money problem that we're in, and, and but it's a big problem and most people don't realize it it's not their fault but we're in this world today where we're in a gen- we're in, in a gambler world right the fiat money system has created a system where people have to gamble and so what happens is we saw on Robinhood or just overall i think about 2 months ago options trading surpassed stock trading for the first time in history so um 
high schoolers today are trading options on Robinhood and trading cryptocurrencies or flipping NFTs. And that's their job. Like we've seen people are dropping out of the workforce at record numbers just because they can trade cryptocurrency or trade NFTs. And the problem is when you're trading, you know, whether it's stock options or NFTs or crypto, whatever it is, you're not producing any value. So when I, I told you at 18, I started buying bank owned repos, I would buy them. They're thrashed. I would have to fix them up. I would have to add value to them. And then I could sell them for more. I was adding value to the world. Typically, we talked about Peter Schiff, right? If there's no goods and services to buy, then, then money's worthless. And so we have to add value to the world. When we're trading NFTs or options or, or cryptos back and forth, we're not providing any value. But what I'm doing is I'm increasing my dollar stack, and then I'm going and stealing value that others are providing to the world. Mm. And so what it's doing is it's creating this net drag. Then The whole world is being dragged down into a place where nobody is creating value. Nobody's creating goods and services. All they're doing is trading worthless digital art or whatever it may be. Um, and that's a big problem for the world. Now, I get it. Um, in the situation that the world is in, I guess if you can't beat them, join them, just be a gambler. Um, but it's a big problem for the world. Absolutely, man. Very well put. It's an awesome guest, Phil. Yeah. Awesome guest. Uh, really appreciate this. Yeah, yeah this is man. great. Great. It's awesome. We're going down a rabbit yeah. hole. It's great. But anyways, right. <laughs> anyways, Phil, it's time for the daily meme reviews. The Daily Meme Review is brought to you by Citadel 21. It's the best Bitcoin cultural zine, and it's scarce. There's only a thousand copies made per volume. Really cool stuff. Stories by plebs, by toxic Bitcoiners, articles, comments, comics, really cool stuff. Anyways, get your print of Citadel 21 today. All right, first meme is brought to us by Samuel, uh, Samuel Lasso. Anyways, it's inflation. It's a big monster. Bitcoiners, normies. The Bitcoiners, they don't care about inflation. Awesome meme. Moving on to the next one. It is by Copernicus, or how I say it, Ooh. Copper Nixon. It is simply Bitcoin, Anna. Shame for not watching any Dave Chappelle comedy special. <laughs> this is for your own good. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. Okay, anyways, by RD underscore BTC, legendary meme, meme lord. For Christmas, I want a dragon. Be realistic. I want the tether fun to end. What color do you want your dragon? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to the next one. By the, our friends at the Bitcoin conference, the orange pill struggle is real. OMG, I must tell everyone I know about Bitcoin so they can protect themselves from intermediate, inter, intermediate. Phil, what is that word? Imminent. All right. All right. Imminent. Imminent financial disaster. Imminent. Screw them. Me. Ah, really cool. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that because yep. you feel bad, but you're also like, oh, man, they don't listen to me. Okay, anyways, by Hon Honk Hogan, shitcoiners, Jack Dorsey. <laughs> man, he went off yesterday. Oh, I love Twitter. it. Okay, he and pissed it, <laughs> off so many shitcoiners. Yeah, dude. Uh, Jack is CEO's Twitter, Jack Unleashed, and this is the follow-up. It's the Drake meme, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Dorsey <laughs> as the puppet. Awesome, awesome memes by the plebs. Guys, this is why you have to join our Telegram group. Link us some Bitcoin memes to review. Anyways, Phil, for those memes, I'm going to give it a very original score of an eraser. Oh, man, nice. I like those. Mm. Like, they fix issues. And they, they feel good to play around with. Right? That weird rubber eraser smell. Okay, anyways, um... You know what? I thought those were great memes as well. Uh, okay, I have to mention, though, the Copper Nixon one, right? That was... Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, Copper Nixon and I are not the same person. I don't know why people keep spreading that rumor. We are not the same person. Um, and number two, that was like an insider meme. So, like, I don't know how many people really got that one. But the rest of them, like, I think they like were more general and easy, you know, easy to, you know, to, to understand, you know, whether you're in or not. Anyways, on that note, I am giving it this... Finger hand exerciser thing, right? Phenomenal but score. On the rating scale, that's up there, Phil. That's up there. Anyways, Mark, what would you give those memes? Well, I don't remember. I can't remember every single meme, but the one that I do remember was the um, school bus wrecking ball Jack Dorsey that has completely demolished the Web3 uh, narrative and sent all the VCs crying into mad scramble. So because of that one, and because I witnessed it in real time and maybe even through a couple of jabs myself, I'm going to give that the keys to the kingdom. Ooh. I don't, I don't oh. think anyone's given a treasure yet. Nope. Because, I mean, we're talking about Bitcoin Jack Unleashed right here. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, a whole, it's a whole new Jack, and it went from uh, Jack being censored to uh, now Jack going big. So I like yeah. it. 
Absolutely. Now it's here comes Jack. Jack unleashed. You know, it's I, that I mean, absolutely right? agree. It's it's man, he went off. I, I don't know what happened to him, but the whole it was like an afternoon of him just going nuts. And, and then he ended up getting blocked, right? He got blocked by Mark Andreessen. So yeah, apparently he did. he's not allowed into Web three anymore. So somehow this decentralized web that is centralized is not going to let Jack in anymore. <laughs> Man, they they hide behind all <laughs> that stuff. These guys are such clowns. Man, they're hypocrites and clowns. clowns. But anyways, guys, you know the deal. We talk about uh, controversial topics on this channel, so subscribe to us on alternative video platforms like Rumble.com and our personal favorite, BitcoinTV.com. And of course, like I said earlier, join our Telegram group, link us a Bitcoin memes to review. But anyways, Phil, it's time for the Daily News. The Daily News is brought to you by CryptoCloaks.com. They make the best 3D printed Bitcoin merch. Look, like the Bitcoin grenade uns unscrews. You put your open dime in there. Really cool stuff. Or the 3D printed Honey Badger opens up. You put your cold card in there. Really cool stuff. Anyways, take advantage of the link down below for 5% off CryptoCloaks.com. All right, so I picked this because Mark was going to come on the show, so I knew he yeah. was going to give a good answer. Oh, we're going to yeah. talk about inflation. We're going to talk about the printing of money, all that good stuff, subjects that we've been covering for quite a long time, and we want Mark to fact check us. Anyways, yeah. check this out, this tweet by Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Giant grocery store chain forced high food prices onto American families while rewarding executives and investors with lavish bonuses and stock buybacks. I'm demanding they answer for putting corporate profits over consumers and working during the pandemic. So I'm a small business owner, specifically in food, and that's not true. That's BS. But anyways, uh, why is this inflation thing happening? We've been telling you guys, right? The way that the Fed justifies the printing of money is they buy assets. They put it on their balance sheet, by the way, Satoshi knew this was going to happen. This is back in 2008, 2009, the beginning of Bitcoin. He called it, he said, Chancellor, on the second bailout for banks, or the, on the brink of the second bailout for banks. And this is when the beginning of the QE experiment started, right? But anyways, let's take a look at the M2 money supply, right? absolutely gone berserk this year, right? So, and now we have a very special guest to talk about all this stuff. So, Mark... Yeah. Elizabeth Warren must know this is propaganda. Yeah. You know, it's something that I ask myself all the time. Like, don't they get this? And I just, uh, I, I kind of come to the conclusion that they don't. I can come to the conclusion that they have been so trained by the Keynesian economic school that, that they've been raised through that they just see the world that way. And, I, and I've come to that conclusion. I have a sister uh, who's an ER doctor. And after coming out of the medical system at medical school, she came home and said, told our whole family, stop taking, med stop taking vitamins. Your health doesn't matter. All you need is pharmaceuticals. Um, right. And I, she had been brainwashed to only think about this. It took about a decade for her to get that off of her eyes. And now she's moved into functional medicine. But I think these people are the same way. I think they've just been so trained to think that this is this complex subject they can manage. The, the economy is this machine that can be built and controlled when the reality is it's not. And I think ultimately it comes down to what we're seeing overall across not just the economy, the markets, but even with the health and, and all these things. I think it comes down to this worldview where I believe that the world, I believe my body, I believe the market is a complex system. Um, and some people think they're God and that they should manage it. They can manage the body. They can. They, Bill Gates said that he needs to upgrade our immune system. He can make our immune system better. Um, some people think they can manage 330 million or 8, 8 billion people in the world, this economy, and they can't. So I think, I think it's a, uh, I think they're, they think they're smarter than they are. So I would say, I would say that's the case. Uh, in Elizabeth Warren and these other people, I think they just don't get it. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I, to, um, to the to yeah. the point uh, to the point you made about Satoshi seeing it, um, I made a video uh, maybe it was a month month ago. The Economist ran an art uh, a headline and it said. Uh, um, economists are blindsided. That's what they said. Blindsided by inflation. No one could have seen it coming. That's what the headline read. The Economist said that. So to your point, right? Um, I and I made a video and I said, well. Mises told us a hundred years ago that the crack up boom would happen. And so the crack up boom very simply is, uh, I, I can say it pretty well, I may get it a little bit wrong, but when we have a monetary and credit expansion that leads to an economic boom, sound familiar, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we have a, a credit and monetary expansion that leads to a monetary boom, economic boom, 
it will lead to distortions in the market that will cause worker shortages and product shortages. Hey, that's what he said. And then he said that will lead then to inflation. And then he said, but suddenly the people will wake up. They will realize that inflation is both intentional and forever. When that happens, they will get rid of their dollars as fast as they can and trade them for anything they can get their hands on. Kind of like people buying homes because they're going to be too expensive in the future. Kind of like buying used cars, 35% over value because they're going to be more expensive in the future. Kind of like buying more toilet paper than I need because I won't be able to get it later. So that's exactly what he predicted a hundred years ago. We knew this was going to happen. Um, I, I, I get into some of the macro conversations with some of the much smarter people than me. And we get into these very academic um, conversations about what inflation is. But Mark, you don't understand the euro dollar market and the yield curve control. And if they pin the yield here, this is what really inflation. And actually, when the Fed produces QE, it's not inflationary because the QE just puts money into the banks and it doesn't get into the system and blah, 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 blah whatever. I'm like, have you seen the stock market chart or the price of homes or the price of Bitcoin or the price of gasoline or the price of steak? Like, I, I don't have to be an ap- academic to have that conversation. Friedman, Milton Friedman says inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, period. That's it. When they increase the monetary supply, either through credit expansion or monetary expansion, we start to see inflation. Now, inflation hits different people in different ways. So, for example, homes in Indianapolis went up 5%. Homes on Lake Travis and Austin went up 150%, right? Uh, it just it, it goes up in different places based off scarcity and other factors, uh, but it's always a monetary phenomenon. Dude, awesome. So, Phil, we weren't wrong. Okay, <laughs> that's the first one, Mark. So, the second thing is... So the way, and we've been covering this for quite a while. We've been covering the crack up boom. We would call Ron Paul came out with an awesome video, essentially saying that you have the tweet from Jack Dorsey hyper. By the way, by the way, I'm speaking on a stage with Ron Paul in a couple of weeks from now. I'm super no. pumped on that cool. in the Fed. Yeah. So uh, Rebel okay. Capitalist live in, uh, wow. in Houston, uh, January 7th. So super stoked on that. We will put the tickets to that down below guys in the link description. If yep. you want to go to that, but So, Mark, the other thing that we've been covering, right, and you're a perfect person to answer this, is essentially, and it goes back to, like, look, if you listen to the mainstream media, not really mainstream, I would call them legacy media, legacy corporate media. Yeah. They've been telling you that inflation isn't real. And then it can't be that two, you know, we're just simple Bitcoiners have been spot on about, about inflation since January. And why have we been spot on? We could read a chart, right? This is the M2s they've never printed at this rate, and right. we were right, and legacy media was wrong. Everything in government was like, we this caught us by surprise. No, it caught you guys by surprise. Bitcoiners have been on the rooftop saying inflation is coming because it was obvious. Right. right. Is this the end of the fiat system? Because the way that we see it, Mark, and the 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 the, the thing that we've been reiterating these last couple of weeks is there is no more road to kick the count down. Right. If they raise rates, they crash the economy, the likes of which is never seen before. And if if and if they stop printing money. So their only option is to keep printing money. But if they keep printing money, more inflation. Right. So I don't see another outcome. There's a third option. There's a third third option. What's the third option? I have a I think that's a 20 tweet thread that's going around Twitter today. It's got over 300,000 impressions saying exactly that. The Fed is stuck between two options, but there's a third scary option that nobody's considering. And so uh, I used Elizabeth Warren that what you pulled up before. And so what what that post is that Elizabeth Warren says, what she's saying, they want to investigate the turkey companies, the grocery store companies. Biden's going to call the FTC why gas is so expensive, blah, blah, blah. What they're signaling is something much more scary. The, the rock in the hard place, to your point, is, is correct, right? If they continue pumping the markets, inflation continue to rage. If they pull back on, on pumping the markets, then the markets will crash. They're stuck, stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place. But what they, so they can't, what are they going to do? Well, what if they keep pumping the markets, but inflation rages, but they cap the prices? Price fixing. 
That's what that post from Elizabeth Warren is hinting. They're saying that these business owners are greedy. They're charging too much profits. Read what she's saying. Read it again yes. now in this light that I'm saying, right? So what mm-hmm. they're setting the stage for is that these people are greedy. They're charging too much and we have to limit the amount of profits they make. That's price fixing. It's what it's what every nation does. This is historical. Every every nation does this exact same thing um, and it fails miserably. But but yeah, so if you look, so yeah, if you look at the, the Romans, right, they did the same thing. They did the same thing, right? Which is we've done know, it in the U.S. We've done it in the U.S. a few times. So, so, yeah. so, the, but that doesn't fix anything, Mark. No, it, it just makes it worse. It just makes it worse because we're here. Here's the big. Here's the big divide with with Keynesian e- economics and Austrian economics. Mises wrote human action. So um, Austrian economics is built on like human psychology, something called incentive and motivation. Keynesian economics leaves that out. Um, also, Marxists leave that out. Hey, I just want to write philosophy all day, but nobody will pay me. So how about since you work, how about you just give me some of your money? But it's like, no, like if you don't get your money, you're not incentivized to work. So this is where they get wrong with price fixing is that if they limit how much profit I can make, then I'm not incentivized to continue to make those goods. And then it leads to shortages. And when it leads to shortages, then prices go up even higher, but typically on the black market. Wow. Okay. So Phil. We got it right, bro. <laughs> we did. We did. <laughs> no, but seriously, you you said right, like two Bitcoiners could get it right, and these and these all these economic economists got it wrong. They're just they're they're so smart in their own mind in this economic theory, but they miss like real world stuff, like human incentive. Man, they're they're smart in the classroom. They're smart yeah. in theory, right? But when you play, when you actually put that theory to practice. None of these people have opened a business, okay? Right, and, and that's that, exactly that, it. That's the thing that I have a problem with. It's like, if you haven't opened a business, you have no idea what you're talking about. You could be a professor of whatever, but if you don't have that experience, I'm not going to listen to you. Anyways, Phil. Yeah. They've never had a real job. That That's you to your point, right? Like, they've never had a real job. They've never really had to actually earn the, the dollar, right? Like, it... it I mean, don't get me wrong, but when you take a look at, you know, especially like, you know, when you look at some of these, uh, you know, some of these resumes, like I I know it may seem like, quote unquote, work, but it's not. You're not actually providing any value. So to your point, right, how long can that go on? How long can a whole bunch of people not providing value? Right. Continue this. And it's very interesting, right, because we're we're essentially um, we're punishing the people. Right. The all of us. Right. The people are getting punished. But the and the government. Right. The government babysitter is making sure that we're going to be okay. when, in fact, they're the incompetent. uh, They're the incompetent party that is, you know, essentially being loose and reckless with the monetary policy. You know, so it's, it's just it's mind boggling. Right. It's like I make a mistake. Therefore, you must suffer. Dude, it's it's absurd. But I, I want to end it with this, right? One last thing, and I think it's a hell of a topic. Bitcoin repla- yeah. will replace oh. the U.S. dollar. Jack Dorsey, I love how they put, made a radical prediction as the price suddenly surges. So, Mark, I, I, and I know that this drove people nuts when he said that. Someone started a poll on Twitter. Absolutely crazy. Do you agree with that prediction? We're biased as hell. We're simply Bitcoin. Of course, hyper Bitcoinization, right? But we want to get your perspective on this. Uh, as much as I would like that to be true, I don't necessarily think that would tr- that will be true. And I, and I guess it really comes down to what is the definition of that mean? And so what um, I have this whole thesis, it's I'm actually in the middle of writing a book on it. Um, I just did a monster episode with Peter McCormick a few weeks ago that I laid this whole thesis out. Um, I just started uh, the the Moss series with Breedlove, you know, Breedlove loves these long series. I just recorded three, three episodes with him on it. Um, and this whole thesis of uh, looking at history to kind of predict where the future is going to go. And um, we're in this this revolution cycle right now, the whole world's changing. And so while everybody's looking for this centralized answer, like, will the dollar remain the reserve currency? Will the Chinese yuan take over? Will we go back to a gold standard? Will the do- will the Bitcoin standard emerge or whatever? Everyone's looking for a centralized answer, but the future's decentralized. And so I've already made Bitcoin my standard. I'm sure you guys have as well. We know S&P 500 companies like MicroStrategy have, now countries like El Salvador have. And so I think more and more people will continue to move over to a Bitcoin standard like we have and the dollar will continue. People will still use it. It's still going to be there. Um, just like all these 8,000 or whatever, 15,000 altcoins, like they're not going to really go to zero because at, at, at some point people just won't really trade them, but there's still going to be something there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have, uh, so, so I think, 
I, I think there's going to be, you know, I think the dollar will probably live for a long time, but you know, it's already lost uh, half of its world trade settlement value, uh, you know, volume. Um, so it's already just losing, losing value. We're seeing, you know, China and Russia are de-dollarizing at this point right now. Um, they're both buying massive gold. They're starting to trade oil outside of the dollar. So it's already losing. Um, so to that, that statement and the question, um, what does that really mean? What's the definition of that? I think it's just going to continue this downward trajectory. Um, I saw back to the crack up boom real quick. Um, I think about trust. So remember, we talked about beginning with Peter Schiff that there is no such thing as intrinsic value, right? We assign value to things. And so it's all based off of trust. And so um, if you had a business partner or a friend or a wife or whatever that you started to lose trust in, like, hey, I think they're stealing from me or cheating on me or whatever, right? And you're starting to lose trust, lose trust, lose trust. You're starting to kind of question them. You're, you're kind of guarded. And then one day you find a piece of evidence and then trust is gone, right? And once it's gone, like it's gone, it ain't coming back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about back to the crack up boom, right? Suddenly people realize that inflation is both intentional and forever. So they're losing trust. Um, and then one day the trust is gone. So think about this. I saw this poll. There's 11,000 people polled in, I think, uh, 76 countries. That's a, that's a good size poll, 11,000 people. 46% of the people said they trust Bitcoin more than their local currency. 46%. So I think I think uh, you know we've already adopted. I think majority of people. I think more and more people will continue to adopt it, and the dollar it, it'll kind of go like this. Um, I don't see it like being gone in the next five or ten years. It's just it's just going to be less hardly used. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. So it, it won't be used. So I, I don't want to get into that, but the political discussion just gets spicy. But anyways, Phil, I think that's a perfect time. There was an open source software release today. Why don't you tell everybody about it? Software releases. The software releases are brought to you by CypherSafe. Check them out, cyphersafe.io. Store your seed in the cypher wheel. It is pet proof, it is tamper proof, it's fill proof and eco proof. So the link is down below. We've got Zeus LN that was released version 0.6.0. .0. Check it out. The link is down below in the show notes. And guys, before you go, remember, we post Monday through Saturday, rain or shine, unless we post otherwise and tell you that we're not posting. <laughs> Anyways, we are on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. We're on Anchor. We're on Pocket, Pocket Cast. And there's at least three other platforms that I'm not sure about. Check us out for the audio only episodes. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. All right, guys, that was our show. Before we go, I want to give a very special shout out to our awesome guest. Confirmed that we were right. Can't believe it. The two plebes proud of us phil anyways go give him a follow on the twitter at one mark moss he's a student of yeah. history sound money advocate freedom maximalist definitely go check out his awesome show he's the first nationally syndicated radio show on our iheart radio it's called yeah. the mark moss show it's also on youtube definitely go check it out guys that was our show if you enjoyed the show smash that like button and if you want to continue hearing the catastrophic fails from the nft shit coiners and the bitcoin news from the plea pleb perspective perspective definitely consider subscribing we'll see you tomorrow guys for a brand new episode of simply bitcoin to quote our guest we've taken electricity and made it digital the time for bitcoin has come